now paused. Ah, I flew from Madrid to Berlin, rented a car, drove to Frankfurt, uh, near Berlin. That's not the Frankfurt, the big one, but the Frankfurt um, and their order. And I re rehearsed there with the orchestra, the Brandenburg State Orchestra and M Michael Stenz. I rehearsed the beautiful Chin Cello Concerto. Right after the rehearsal, I dashed to the airport, flew from Berlin to Helsinki, took a train to Lahti to rehearse and play there the Dvoja Concerto with the Lahti Symphony and Roderick Cox. After the concert in Lahti, I had to take a train at night to sleep at the airport because the next morning I had a 7 a.m. flight back to Berlin, rented a car again, sped to uh, Frankfurt order once more for my dress rehearsal um, with the chin, which I played that same night. And then the next night I played it in Potsdam. Um, after that I had three days off, so I flew back to Madrid, only to fly back to Helsinki yesterday, taking the train, this time not to Lahti, but half hour longer to Tampere, where I rehearsed this morning the Elga Concerto. And the concert is tomorrow night uh, with uh, Matthew Halls. We had a very good rehearsal today, two and a half hours. I think that piece has hardly ever been rehearsed so intense and with so many very nice details. Uh, I, I like that rehearsal. Um, and after the concert there's a little party, but I have to head back to the airport with a train which takes about one and a half hours because the next morning I have a flight to Geneva at eight so I can sleep a little longer than last week um, but in Geneva I'm playing the absolutely gorgeous Dutilleux uh, cello concerto, it's not a cello concerto, it's called Tout, Tout un monde lointain with the um, Orchestre Suisse Romande and Thierry Fischer and that's it so I have these four concertos, Dvorak, Elgar, Chin and Dutilleux within 11 days, which is, it feel, I thought it was more intense than it actually was. Partly because I played the Elga and the Dvorak in, um, yeah, in, in Australia last month, so it's not as horrible. I'm just seeing this is a bit dark here, one second. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing any, I see a lot of waves, but no questions. So ask me a question, otherwise I'm going to bore you with some, oh, let's see, some theoretical stuff. That's boring. Oh, no, nobody dares to ask a question. Oh, then now it's too light. Sorry. Uh, um, oh, there's a question. Ah, very nice. Hi, Claire. Uh, she has a question, but she just says question and then nothing comes. Did you ask it already? Oh, oh, by the way, can you tell me if this is an A? <laughs> because I'm using this uh, Zoom and sometimes I put the wrong uh, whatever and then it sounds like another note. So if I hope that's an A. Please tell me. Ah, oh, there is a question from... Matisius one. My favorite sonata. Well, uh, that would be definitely... Oh, you're saying it's reversed? What is reversed? I'm reversed. Rasmus and Cello says I'm, I'm reversed. Oh, that's not good. But back to the question. Uh, my, my favorite sonata... Ah, <laughs> uh, it's hard. Solo sonata, definitely Kodai, which I probably played three, four hundred times in my life. I absolutely adore that piece and and somehow as as demanding as it is once you really learn it and play it a couple of times it sits in your hand well and and um, I could play it tonight it's 7 p.m. now if I would practice now for an hour just to remind myself of all the things it's it's really deep in my brain then I I could probably play it I mean, I'd prefer another day to practice it, but if I had to, that's possible. Piano and cello sonata, well, 
Brahms, E minor or F major, they're both gorgeous. Too many nice pieces actually. I mean, the Beethoven sonatas are fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint. But if I had to choose one, I think Brahms F. It's also because I have such a long history that part of the history is uh, I wanted to study. Um, well, I studied for a year in America with a teacher that didn't really work out so well. So I gave up on that and um, I was 18 or 19 and, and, and I knew Heinrich Schiff, so I wanted to study with him. But he couldn't do it because he took a year off, maybe because he didn't want to teach me. So he took, no, he, he took a year off and he re recommended to me I should meet Boris Pergamenchikov. And in order to get into the class of Boris Pergamenchikov, I had to attend one of his master classes. And actually he wasn't free and I was nervous and I didn't play so well. But he told me later that he was taken by me having how I played the beginning of the slow movement of the F major cello sonata, which goes this. he liked was how I created different sounds later throughout the throughout the uh, movement with the pizzicato. I didn't always pizz the same and I didn't go pluck 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 but I, I played a line and he saw that I had put some thinking into how I wanted these pizzicatos to sound. He saw there was somebody who had some kind of imagination of how it could be or should be. Um, so that's, that's why he made an exception and took me into his class, which I'm very grateful for because those were very important three years I spent with him in Cologne. He died, unfortunately, far too early. I can't believe he died the same age I have now. And I thought he was this old guy and I was very sad and sorry that he died. But I don't feel that old like I thought he was. But well, I am. Um, okay, so that's favorite sonata, covered that. Sorry, uh, oh, what am I doing? Um, it's an A, but video is flipped, but how can the video be flipped? How can I do that? If I do this? No, now it's flipped. <laughs> flipped. It's just the cell phone, so I don't know how to do that. Um, there's another, clear, okay. How do you focus your mind on the music and not... Okay, I can do this here. How do you focus your mind on the music and not on the distraction of playing? Ooh, that's a good one. How do I do that? That's... Uh, th th that's not easy. Because obviously we have so many tasks at hand. Producing the sound and then intonation and and uh, with the bow of contact point, speed, weight, uh, vibrato, and all these... Uh, hmm, what's the word? All, all these things we have to think of and to use to make music. And how to forget about that, well, you might guess part of the answer is my daily routines. That's why I the older I get, the more adamant I'm doing them one hour every day when I have to be in shape. Because that puts me in a, sh a shape where I can play the repertoire without worrying too much about intonation, for example. It's, it's still, I mean, still, I'm, I'm not playing everything perfectly in tune, but it's somewhere there, so I can really then focus much more on the music than on the technical problems. And um, I try to ignore the fact that there are technical problems. I, I try not to focus on that when playing. Um, but that's not a good answer. I know I'm not happy with that answer. Uh, not this section of playing. Well, and, and sing inside. I, I, I sometimes even 
out loud when you get nervous maybe but to sing inside and 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 it is important to feel you have the control over what you're doing so you're not you shouldn't get completely self-indulged in 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 your singing so we need to have some kind of control over the technical aspects as well otherwise you might think you played so beautiful but if you, we still have to listen what we're doing but to to focus on the music rather than on the technical part is is I, I can do that easier with pieces I played a lot. With a piece I have not played much, or yeah, then, then I'm, I have to control more. But if I played something a lot of times, dozens or hundreds, this comes easier. So learning by doing definitely and, and, and getting used to these pieces, live with these pieces. So you don't, don't expect from yourself that this will come immediately as much as you might sing and breathe and practice daily routines to play a piece over and over again and, and to perform it maybe even perform it for a, any any friend or your dog or put yourself in the position of, of playing and not playing through for the sake of playing through but really performing you could even perform to the mirror or put the camera just oh yeah that's a good idea you put the camera and and you think you're doing now some kind of really important video and you will send it somewhere. So you, you, it needs to be great and you want to convey everything you have. So that, that puts you under, it's, it's artificial stress, but that is some kind of stress. And if you do that a couple of times, you might get used to it. Not only used to it, but then you might come to that level where you can actually focus more on the music than on the technical challenges. And then... Um, you also ask to be able to present in the music and performance, giving the audience the music and not obsessed with the act of playing. Exactly. Yes, I understood that. To be able to get out of your way and channel the music, separate yourself and become one with the music while you perform. That's the goal, but that's definitely not the easiest of all tasks. But you describe it very nicely. We should let the music speak and and don't worry about instrument and people watching what they could think of us. Yeah, that's also quite important. Don't don't think of being judged. You will be you might be judged, you might not, but you cannot that's not really in your hands. So worry about the things you can actually change and that is how you perform. And don't get sidetracked. So if you get sidetracked too much, maybe try mindfulness. I mean this I, I just started this mindfulness thing. And they always, well, they, they kind of welcome thoughts coming, but then they, so they try to train you, or at least the one I have, tries to, tries to train you how to let the thoughts be and not, and, and not get wrapped up in them. So actually mindfulness in playing. When I started mindfulness with this application, Headspace, uh, it, um, it reminded me, of, many, of something I've done in music. So when I play and, and negative thoughts creep in, I really, I don't block them out, but I, I try to accept them and, 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 and send them away because they're not helpful. I mean, obviously negative thoughts like, oh, I could get lost or, oh, this person is getting bored or, oh, the conductor doesn't like, like me or, uh, or I haven't eaten yet. What can I have for dinner? Whatever silly thoughts come in which distract you from the music this whole mindfulness is quite helpful i think um mark is asking have you ever heard about oh god my contact lenses are not really working oh it's too dark have you ever heard about sumiel sumiel no what is that sumiel no sorry you have to explain that sorry um, greetings from Hawaii. Hi, Ismail. Question. When performing Bach Suites, any tips to an, on endurance issues, especially, specifically for full performance of suites? The more tired I get, the more I end up rushing. Oh, I like if you end up rushing. That's, that's always a good thing. <laughs> I don't like if Bach is 
being played too heavy and, and self-important. Mind you, there is some theory that Bach might have written them as etudes. But no, I, you shouldn't be rushing through it. You should play the music as beautiful as you can. And for the endurance part, well, that again, my, my daily routines, and some of them I do for one specific thing. So I, I have this Cosman, which goes like... Like this. And I do that actually not to have fast trills, or not even to have fast fingers, but to remind my hand to push the string down like this. So the most basic of all basic things. But that answers your question about endurance in Bach. Because if you push down the string like this, you will hardly get through six suites, I think, in a row. Because that is so tiring, um, having to push so hard. And if, I, if you play it in that way, the hand doesn't really get tired. So I can play these suites and the fingertips start not getting tired, but they might hurt after three hours of playing. But I'm not, the hand is not tired. And the right hand, okay, that, that's the left hand. I mean, something. That is this, the, probably the most tiring of all sweets because of that stretch. So I don't know if you could see, but I'm not really stretching. I'm, I'm moving my hand. So I try to have, I mean, on the one hand, I'm pushing down the string like that, but also I don't... It's even more important on my cello because um, why is it important? Oh, because it's so big. So if I would stretch the whole thing, I would die. Or I die. Uh, right hand. I saw a very famous cellist play the first bass suite like this. Uh, oh, sorry. upper half on the fingerboard and I think that's well you, you might manage if, if you play with no sound then you don't get tired but if you want to play with sound these beautiful pieces and I think even if you play as baroque as you like there should be sound so, so you have to get into the string but getting into the string is tiring so in order to get into the string and and not get too tired, frog. So you have to... myself and that's why maybe I'm playing now more at the frog than I would be in a concert but actually not uh, I, I try to keep stay at home this is home and this is not home I mean it's even so far out the camera doesn't catch my arm so I have to oh. um, here at the frog for all those non cellists we can apply our full weight. So to make a loud noise, it's, it's, it's the easiest at the frog. If I do the same here, oh, and I have tennis arms, so that actually rust just hurt. Uh, to, to play loud there, it's hard. To play loud here, it's actually you have to control. And there comes the problem. People often, I mean, not people, 
cellists are, or string players tend to be afraid of the frog because you might make an ugly noise, which is the reason for my daily routine number one. I'm like a, like a salesman here. Buy my daily routines. Uh, the daily routine number one is uh, something Pergamentic called the banana bow. So we, we, we are supposed to, to grab the string like... Oh God, I'm tired of this camera being either too dark or too... Um, that, that we get the string to speak at the frog or wherever, yeah, here, I mean, close enough to the bridge, especially C string. And you could say, oh, you have a nice cello. No, that works on any cello. I'm, whenever I teach in person, which I don't do regularly, but in a master class, I always use the cello of the students to, to show that actually most cellos do everything. I mean, an old Italian does sound nicer maybe than most cellos, but technical things are possible on more or less every cello. And why do I say that now? Oh yes, if we feel comfortable at the frog, then we can play the softest stuff on the frog. Like I just played the Chin Concerto in Potsdam in Frankfurt Order. And the beginning of that piece goes like this. So there's like two empty bars and then the cello comes in pianissimo. Oh, that was horrible. To breathe and then... So I have one bow. I have to start that very soft note on the frog in pianissimo. There's, I mean, there's the harps are doing cling, plung, cling, and then we are going. Why am I so bad now? Because I'm trying to make a point. In the in the concert, it's so much easier because now it's trembling. So there's a crescendo to the B natural. And I'm saying that because for that you need the training of being able to play close to the frog and not have any... I mean, to do, to do that is easy, but to play very soft at the frog, banana bow for me is essential. I do it every morning. Chan Yitwei. Hi. Uh, greetings to Kuala Lumpur. Could you talk about how your musical considerations differ when you play as a soloist from when you play as a tutti player in an orchestra? Um, well, for those who don't know me, I'm sometimes when I play with an orchestra, I ask the cello group and the conductor if I could sit in in the second half. And often they say yes, sometimes they say no. Out of various reasons they say no but when they say yes I do play sometimes in a tutti side reading the part even though it's not really side reading I have played many orchestra pieces in the cello section so some of them I know last week after the chin I played Heldenleben Hero's Life from Richard Strauss which my father gave me to my birthday for my 18th birthday I got to substitute with Burn and Phil with that piece. So I I have it quite well. But you want to know the musical considerations. Well, when I play a concerto, I'm the boss. Or if I'm not the boss, I'm a very strong partner with the conductor and we discuss the interpretation. But it's my thing. I know the piece obviously much better than any orchestra piece I've ever set in. But um, I still, I, I, I love music, so that's why I, I sit in an orchestra and play for free in the second half. And I'm still making music, so your question is a good one. I have to, well, I have to fit into the group. I don't want to stand out. That's the, the last thing I want to do if I play in the cello group. I don't want to stand out. Still, 
I don't agree that I should play here. So if there's something soft, um, I, I play still closer to the bridge, but... And sometimes they have these many bows, bow changes on a long note, then, then I change it, but I refuse to go here. I think that's not really helpful for the sound. I mean, yes, sometimes in very special moments, then I, I, I do that as well. But um, actually, I should have mentioned that in the rehearsal today, when the violas start the... And then, and then the then the cellos come in after that they play and then the solo cello comes in and I, I always find that the, the violas play and when the cellists come they start with the up bow and they start on the fingerboard and it often sounds like like a sudden because if a viola plays there, it's, they still have more overtones. The cello on the G string on the fingerboard has absolutely no overtones. So while they should start soft, it shouldn't be loud, but they should... With substance in the sound. It's this, there's this misconception of especially cellists that they think if we play close to the bridge, it's this. But you can play super soft at the bridge. Uh, like when I when I start the, the whole thing, then... Ah, oh, that's horrible. Huh? This sound can be heard. In an orchestra, I leave my ego also at home uh, or in my dressing room. So I, I put my ego away and if I don't agree with something musically, I, I obviously I have no right to argue. It's the conductor's thing. So I'm, I take a step back but still try to serve whatever I feel the conductor wants. So that's a long answer to a short question. Sorry. Mark. Uh, I usually have nerve problems during performing and it's nothing to do with stress. My hands just start shaking, but I'm not stressed in my brain. Don't know what to do about it. I had the same when I was your age. A lot of shaking and... Um, well, my my, my uh, solution was a lot of work, basic work, like the, the banana bow was one of the reasons at first, because I was nervous, so I needed to tame my nerves. Um, and also here, just to be in good shape. I felt when I was in a good shape, I wasn't as nervous anymore. And once I managed to trust my uh, bow, and I knew what I could do and what I couldn't, or I wasn't as as shaky anymore. And also. Because I wanted to be a musician, I knew I couldn't win a single audition with my gig 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 gig. I, I solved it in a way, well, you say you, it's not really in your stress, but I got stressed somehow and I got nervous and I... And my solution was that I took myself out of the center of my attention. So I tried to not make it about me, but about the music and, and, and I realized that it's... The, the only person who really cares how I play is me. Everybody else couldn't care less. So I, that made me less, less nervous to realize it's really not such a big deal. And if I get lost or if I play a note out of tune, I mean, if you get nervous in an audition, I feel with you because that's a stressful thing. But even there, I mean, you just prepare as well as you can in, in, the, in the audition or in the competition just try, try to think of the poor people having to listen to you. It's a nightmare. I mean, I sat in one, two juries in my life and 
when they asked me for the Queen Elizabeth competition a few years ago, I, I said, no, thank you. Count me out because that is so tiring, sitting there and listening over and over and over again to these people playing the same. <sighs> no, I, I cannot do it. So think of poor me if I would be sitting in a jury and, and try to make it interesting. So don't even worry so much that... <laughs> just made a cross to hit the B because that's a, f a scary one so we yeah don't, don't worry about these things but rather try to seduce them with your music making and and try to do something beautiful and spontaneous and and not occupy your brain oh god what would they want to hear no just they just want to be as any audience they want to at the end of the day be entertained that's a bad word I know but then don't call it entertained. They want to be filled with beauty or uh, they want to see who you are. So, so give them a view into your soul by, by really playing as engaging and as, as you feel it in the moment. That's easier said than done, I agree, especially when there's stress. That's why it's important to to stim no not stimulate to simulate stimulate simulate the stress when practicing as i said before put a camera and film yourself and, and you want to post that and go viral with it because you're such a great player so so you, you need to find some artificial stress to get used to then finally doing some auditions or what what else um Oh, sorry, there's Ismail again from Hawaii. The fifth and sixth suite there, if that matters, thank you. Well, as I said, play at the frog. If you, if you use too much bow, you get tired here. And if you press down here, you get tired as well. Try to, to play as economical as possible. No, that's why I'm a bit upset when I see famous people play not economical because young people tend to copy the famous people and I had some students play Bach here and yeah it does, doesn't work I mean the, the famous person manages but he manages because he's very talented and he has a very good cello so he doesn't have to produce so much sound but if you have a poor cello and you play there it sounds even worse yeah I, otherwise no I have no recommendation just practice oh practice with earplugs so it, in th that means in your rehearsal room or practice room, you will play with more energy than you do when you d if you don't play. Yeah, you, you, you play with energy and more sound. You need to prepare yourself that you play the sound you need to, you will play. I have to check some, if there's some questions here in Instagram, sorry. I was focusing now on the questions from YouTube and Facebook book uh, huh, huh. Uh, the Instagram people are quiet today that's all right but if, I'm sorry it takes a while because I, s I get a message from people who join is there any way I can filter I don't need to know who joined I just need to see the questions why can I just why that's really silly maybe there is a way so if somebody knows the way please tell me because I'm going slowly through this thing here. Oh. Ah, here. Raphael is asking, can you please recommend me some bow technique methods for high school? High school. Um, yeah, check out my daily routines, number one, two, three. I mean, people normally, bow, bow technique, they think it's something uh, ricochet, like in you want to know ricochet or the, the stupid staccato or the, but first for me bow technique is not that those are virtuosic techniques you also need to learn yes but the the real art of using the bow is actually not so much in, in the virtuosic stuff but the daily stuff just just to be able to play a, a slow bow so 
so and 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 to have a bow change without doing something crazy here for that i recommend long bows close to the bridge oh here and on this you can even see my bridge one second um to see how long I could go. I mean, the C string is the easiest, or the hardest, but it's the easiest to play very long. And go as close to the bridge as you can. And keep the, the arm heavy. D don't do that. Tr try to use just your, your heavy arm, and even if you go to the tip, more important than learning all these fancy stuff while well, you have to learn ricochet at some point but there's a video just check it out that will go too far to teach ricochet right now uh, um, not ricochet speak speak uh, any tips on cello yehun any tips of practice the last octave passage and was at first movement especially with overused thumb pain even with callus calluses just as you practice normal double stops. Sorry. Ah, now you see what I did. I corrected. Don't correct. There was flat. like this and then the next step would be so if you play something out of tune don't correct but go back the one step so then and and mind you full sound full often people practice I see oh and when I teach they go then like No, we need all the overtones. And we need the same kind of uh, we finally play with. So if, if you then comes the real thing, you fall apart. To prepare your thumb, my, uh, again, oh, I'm so boring, my daily routines. Um, I'm the number four is, no, number daily routine number five is what I call Oistrach. Like this, and also with a thumb. And back, and the other way around. And that makes your thumb like a real finger. And also practice the swarm. Uh, at the end, I always practice the swan five times with each finger, and the, to practice the swan with a thumb sounds ugly as hell. I know. Why is that out of tune? So if you practice like that, your thumb will get so much better that the octaves become piece of cake because he's in shape and he knows what to do and he's a real support to the other finger so actually the the idea of octaves is that you play the, the lower octaves louder so the thumb should be even more than <laughs> ah no I'm using second finger sorry because now I was like oh how do I do my thingies so that's enough 
Now, another question. There's nothing. Okay. Raphael is asking, can you please recommend some bow technique methods for high school? Oh, I did. Sefcik. Oh, sorry. That's the, you, you, I didn't answer, so you ask again. Yeah, Sefcik is also good. I'm doing, that's my third daily routine. It's... That's a very helpful exercise and just for those who don't know what the daily routines are, I picked a couple of things which are important to me and I do them since 30 years. So I do this sefcik since 35 years. Pergamanchikov gave it to me and I realized, oh, that's hard. And then I only do that. You don't have to work through an entire book of sefcik. This, I believe, is enough because it teaches you to get out of the string in the string, in the, in the, here, at the, whatever that's called, balance point of the bow. So at the frog would be easy. But to do it here, so it's like applied banana bow. How do you avoid too high wrist? Often see myself playing with the too high wrist. Well, if you realize it, which one, the right or left hand? Um, just watch, play in front of the mirror and, and watch your, your wrist. I mean, sometimes it's good to have like, if you do. So I, for the longest time I played and then come all the way up. So he, it's good to be already not only wrist high, but elbow high. So, so we are there already. But normally I play with the elbow low, which is another advice for the Bach Suites. This, not this. If you're for three hours this, your arm will fall off. No, the arm whenever you can, low. I mean, sometimes we have to go here, but... Mm. And here, high wrist. No, I think you mean the left hand, no? Okay, uh, M. Sevoldo, hi. Do you record your playing and listen when you practice? I want to know how to practice efficiently for performing. Well, I did when I was younger and now since COVID, I started doing the whole filming and editing. Uh, and that is definitely very, very helpful. Although I must say with the earplugs, it's already like recording yourself because you hear how it sounds farther away. It's like your alter ego is, is listening. So I'm never really surprised when I hear myself after recording. And most people are surprised. They, they think, oh, no, that's not me. Oh, that must be the recording. No, no, the re that's you. So if it's boring, that's, that's you. Or if it's flat, that's you. The recording doesn't um, change that. Uh, I had this discussion with somebody once and, and it was a lady cellist and she, she thought, that was crazy because people loved her so much when she played. But those people were her friends and, and she was very expressive in her face. But the, in, the, in the recording, it was, and she sent me one of her recordings, I mean, this live thing, and it was really flat. The, musically, not much happened. And she, I told her and she was very upset. But after a year or so, she came back to me and said, well, actually, I had a point. So all her, and, and she was very sincere, how she talked about music. It was very sincere and beautiful. So she felt the music on a deep level. And probably when she played, she, she enjoyed it a lot, but she wasn't listening at the same time what came out. So yes, do record yourself. That's a very important thing. Hi, tomato juice. I have, oh God, my contacts. Your daily routines and the Oistrach. Can you talk briskly about the daily routine that comes after this. That's the, that's for ya. And different variations. And what do you want to know? Um, uh, um, well, I do that because it, it 
helps me map out the fingerboard, so I don't have to worry about shifting and playing. And I have now I added the, the with a thumb. the other way around and also should be more in tune I'm just making the point here so I play that I practice it slower and then it takes me about 20 minutes every day and it's not getting any better so it's hard but I do it, I don't give up. It's like the, I'm like Sisyphus rolling the, the, the stone up the hill and then it rolls back down. Uh, that's how it feels, but that's like any sports person is doing the same basic stuff. I mean, you see these highly paid soccer players, how they train has nothing to do with music, uh, has nothing to do with football, but it, it gives, puts their body in, in the position to play much better. The agility and the whatever they the balance exercises, you wouldn't think so. So and they do that even though they're great athletes, they still do it. And I'm not a great athlete, but I want to be a good cellist, even though I don't care about cello so much. I love music, but in order to play, I need to be obviously uh, mastering the instrument, and that's why I do these exercises, which are simple but. They are enough. I don't need any other etudes, nothing. So that's the after the Oestrach, number six, no? Um, oh, that's a good one. Do you have your specific respiration way on stage? Well, deep breathing and and, and really letting, let, letting go. And whenever you feel that, like the yeah, mindfulness, feel the connecting of your feet, feel how you sit. And, and focus more on that than on that, especially when you get nervous. So yeah, I, I, when I started mindfulness, I found a lot of things I was doing already while playing the cello, but now I'm doing it also for myself, not just for the music. Uh, and you, uh, Enze Voldok wants to know tips on about Prokofiev concertante. <laughs> That's a. 36 minute piece, at least in my interpretation, of 35. Um, I don't think it should be much longer. Well, one tip is don't listen to Rostopovich, don't listen to anybody, just make sense of it yourself. Don't overindulge in the second theme. Don't get too slow in the... Um <laughs> And, and yeah but otherwise it's a great piece practice it and enjoy but like second theme in the, the second movement <laughs> So that's too slow, actually, and that's already faster than what I hear in master classes. It's, uh, so we are. Uh, how does it go? Why I do daily routines because I haven't played that piece in when was the last time half a year or something but I'm I'm in good enough shape to well it wasn't perfect now but I, I could quite quickly relearn that but my point here was like that's our tempo so um, so that's maybe too prosaic so take your time at the beginning Go. And actually, 
no crescendo. Keep it beautiful and light. It's not all and it's not juicy. It's beautiful. It's like a fairy tale music, and then oh, all this down. Yeah. Keep it going. All the last movement. <laughs> Russian vodka drinking guy. No, he was quite sarcastic and witty. So go for it. I love that piece. Oh, I can't wait to play it again. I think next time we'll be in Sydney, beginning of August. I'll play it again. Okay, so that I did this and now is there another question here? If not, oh yeah, here, Cello Yoon. Any tips for practicing the last octave? Oh, I did that already. Why? Um, um, uh. mm, mm, mm. Uh, or maybe I go to the very end. Oh God, it's long, it's long, I, I missed. So, oh, sorry, cancer. I love your music, Dvorak Cervenza. Thank you very much. It's not my music, it's the Dvorak. Um, but thank you. Mahidol, who's Mahidol? Have you ever considered coming to Thailand? Yes, I'm on tour with the Asian Youth Orchestra in August. But unfortunately, I don't play the concert in, in, in Bangkok. I play in Singapore. The concert in Singapore is on the 12th of August, I think, or 13 or something. And then the orchestra goes to Bangkok, but they you have a different soloist for that. So I miss out the concerts in Thailand. Okay, Walrush One. Welcome to Tampere. Thank you. Your hometown. Excited to listen to you tomorrow. Thank you. Question. In Elgar Sek movement, I have been struggling and playing in tempo and clearly without messing up bar before first poco alargando. You mean the... I mean, this movement... Practice it with metronome. Like, 100 to whatever... 10? Oh, uh, it was wrong. So all quiet in the string. Fast, it, it will go jumpy, but it, it's... Oh, and for the... So with the metronome, then you get faster and faster. I mean, play the whole thing through six times until you get to 160. Maybe really da 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 not says there but and the next one is even a tempo so not all the stuff around yeah but if that is not helpful enough use the rhythms Yeah. Good. 
And then the other way around. Three fast, one long. Da -da -da -dum. <laughs> Ach, Mensch! So now I will play it much better thanks to you tomorrow. Uh, yeah, that's my only advice for that. Okay, I'm going backwards now to see old messages on Instagram. But maybe I, so if I didn't, now I switch back to the very end. So if, if there is somebody, if I didn't answer your question, just write it now. I will see it. And here's something. Um, oh, yeah, you're very welcome. Um, if you don't have any other question, I will probably order some food now because I haven't eaten since lunch and I have to teach online in one hour. Uh, oh, there's one. Oh no, Juan is just saying hello from Mexico. Hi Juan. <laughs> Thanks for checking in. Um, last chance for a question you always wanted to know. If not, it's one hour, it's enough, isn't it? Oh, here. Oh. Um, Walrush asks, do you play in the written speed 160? Yes, I do. Or faster. Mm, not much. Often, often it slows down against my will. Especially after the... Because that feels like fast, but it's not. It's the 130 maybe, what I just played. So then one has to go back. And I would advise to always think kind of what am I doing? So give it tight, not an accent, but but So you you pronounce Ba, 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 da, 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 just a little. If you play slowly, so each time the elbow goes a little, da, 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 da. it's quite helpful for orchestra conductor and the audience to understand that it's ba 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 ba, not da 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 piece of advice. Uh, is there something else? Oh yeah, there's, there's one. Um, Elis asks, I'm struggling with shoulder pain on proper Hungarian Rhapsody fast stuff. Ooh, you shouldn't have shoulder pain. That's bad. Practice in front of the mirror and check how you sit. And don't do that. If you do that, the, the uh, Hungarian Rhapsody is not really a difficult piece. So if that causes you pain, it might be too difficult for you right now. I, I would take the step back and, and, and work on basics. That's like really... You see, I'm, I'm turning 55 next month and I still do every day the basics. I don't do etudes. I think for young people it's good to also play an etude, but much more important are those basics. And, and you don't have to become my patron to find them out. I think on YouTube I, I put one where I play through all my daily routines. And you don't have to do these daily routines, but you have to find something for you which is like that, I think. And you don't have to work through all those books and kind of, ah, now I did it. No, it's, it's about how you do it. If you, Pergaminchikov said, and I used that quote so many times already, um, for that Sevchik. He said, I hope I'm right, that it was that piece. He said, I should treat it like a newly discovered Beethoven sonata. 
And actually, I treat any piece I play like a newly discovered Beethoven piece. Just with the utmost musical and sound and everything dignity. Sound meaning, um, well, it doesn't have to be beautiful, good sound. I mean, you should never play here. So if you play these daily things, like when I do, I'm, I'm after one hour and five minutes, I'm always quite not exhausted, but, but it's, it's a workout. I mean, I, I'm, I'm using full sound, even my stupid Cosman. I'm seeing where my bow is. Doesn't sound good, does it? Poor neighbors here. This is really, I, I'm going and I'm not uh, making that only for this video. That's how I practice. That's why I normally play it with my hotel mute because it's just too much. That's horrible. And stay in the string, stay close to the bridge. Don't go, Ugh. no, it's, it's a training. The, these, these daily routines I do, they're not only there for the sake of it, but to also put me in the shape endurance wise. I work really hard with sound wise. I'm close to the bridge, slow bow. And I, I, I play them always. I, I play, I know them so well. I can really watch at the same time how my body is at the same time, like doing, having the, the right posture. And so, so that will avoid your pain. If you have pain, you're not doing anything wrong with a popper. You're doing wrong, wrong with playing the cello. And I would take a step back. The popper is too difficult right now because if you're young and you have pain already, so many older colleagues have back pains because they get get their strength from this. And, and that's not a good idea. Sorry for breaking that to you. Um, and that was it, I think. Or is there something else at the end here? The, uh, no. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, OHP and, oh God, my. In your opinion, what is the most common problem you see among students, be it technical or musical issues? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, technical issues, as I'm talking constantly, not enough basic um, training. Bow, I feel it's a bit uh, generic, like always quite fast bow speed and not enough variety in bow speed not enough thinking about what the bow could do. Bow separation, like the music comes from the bow. And uh, I mean, that's technical. And here probably too, too, too tense. This has to be, yeah, we have to push the string down, but not like this. So that's one problem. Bow, that's a problem. And the speed is a problem. Musically, too much copycats. I have not seen enough I mean, I, I, I'm not a teacher, but whenever I hear cello or teach cello, famous pieces, they often sound very, very similar to famous recordings. And that I find sad because, especially when the same famous recordings are beside the point. Like, I love Rostopovich, but his recordings of most pieces are his recordings. They have no value other than he was a great cellist and he inspired the composers so they have great value but not to not as a point of orientation nada so don't, don't look at him for advice i'm playing the dutilleux in two days i might have heard his performance i mean his recording maybe 20 years ago when i learned the piece but only after i knew after i learned it i listened to it and i realized oh i don't like what he's doing and i left it now you can say, oh, but he worked it with Dutilleux. No. And even if he did work it with Dutilleux, uh, Dutilleux was a very gentle man. And he was so happy that a great cellist like Rostopovich would play his piece. And it was very convincing. So he wouldn't say, no, I want that. But what the composer wants is in the score. So don't listen to tons of recordings. Listen to a lot of music. And music by the composer you're playing, but not by any interpretation of the Dvorak cello concerto. I mean, pff, 
Come on. Don't. Have your own ideas. Uh, so that's the most common problem. Then uh, do you think of your left arm elbow doing rotations or... Oh, in order to press down the strings. Your left arm elbow doing rotations or just going up and down in order to press down the string. Rotation? No, you go down. Uh, why would we rotate? Well, I think of here when I have to go up that I don't get stuck too long and then move it. But no rotation. I, I, th th that's also a little bit the problem in cello playing. Things look something, like if I play, it looks as, as if I shake my hand, but I'm not shaking my hand. I, I don't know what I'm doing, but here's a rotation, yeah. But actually, I'm, I'm doing something here, and, and the hand is just reacting. Or if I do a bow change, the, the, the fingers do something, but they're more reacting to me moving the bow here. So the bow is in the string and then, but I'm not doing this. So I think there's a lot of superfluous movement. Obviously we are not stiff, there is flexibility, but the default way of a bow change should rather be like this, with as much hair as possible and the, the hand as calm as possible. Um, so that was that. And we're almost done, I think. No, I'm hungry. Um, there was one last here. Uh, sorry. Mm. Um, MC Voldoc, don't be sorry. Um, because this is a very valuable opportunity, I don't want to take away when you start new piece. How do you approach to that, for example, harmony ana analyzing or listen to other recordings or read a book about the background of the composer. Well, I don't listen to recordings. Um, actually, the last piece I... No, I learned something else. But the last thing coming to mind was the, mind was the Weinberg Concerto. And actually, it's a beautiful piece and I learned it. And I didn't know anything about... I didn't analyze it. I, I did that as a student and I realized it didn't help much. The composers didn't analyze what they wrote. They heard something and they put it on the paper. Um, listening to a lot of music as a child was helpful. So I understand music from a deep level so that I could recommend to anybody to listen to as much music as possible. Possibly also by the composer but actually Weinberg I've never heard anything by him when I played the piece. And um, Later I found out things about him which were interesting but they didn't surprise me. I could find all these things in the music. I mean just in his, what he wrote. There's so much pain and hurt and, and um, but also um, humor and, and, and yeah, it's, it's in the music and, and would it have helped me to know that his family was killed by the Nazis in the Holocaust? No. It's all in there. I didn't need that information. When I heard it, it's, it's good to know these things if you want to have a pre-concert talk. But for my interpretation, good composers, it's in the stuff. I love to read, but I, I love to read fiction more than I like to read composers' biographies. And I must say, not a single composer biography has helped me understand the composer better. Brahms. Sometimes I use what I learned to, to tell people off when they play Brahms like like this and you say no, he was this man with this unfulfilled love. But it's all in the music. It's in the music is not you see this 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 Sturm und Drang in there and, and there is a performing tradition in many ways which goes super heavy and then I, but I don't need to know about Brahms life to avoid that. Or even if I know about Brahms life, people still play it like he was this fat old guy with a cigar in his mouth. But for the longest time he was a very good looking young man, madly in love with Clara Schumann, whom he couldn't have. And um, yeah, that's information obviously completely wasted because people play, like I'm thinking of Brahms symphonies, which often come like this 
old German fat bleh, train. And it's, yeah, it's so much more to it. Sorry, that's my personal opinion. Read your uh, composer's biographies by all means. It's good to read. Lovely to see you all and thanks for listening and hope to see you next time I come around. All best. Bye. So how do I turn this off? Oh god, the same thing as always. And now and here as well. Bye.